This episode of StoryWorthy is sponsored by Story02 Software from Jungle. You guys, Story02 is fantastic. It's a way to outline and define your story. So whether you're writing fiction or nonfiction, an essay, a novel, a screenplay, or even a one-person show, Story02 Software will help you get your story out there with a beginning and a middle and an end. Now, there are customizable story paradigms, character image packs, and the ability to import and export final draft. You heard me. So head on over to junglesoftware.com and check out Story02 and enter the coupon code STORYWORTHY, that's all one word, to receive 10% off. Story02 by Jungle Software. There is nothing out there like it to tell your story. Hi, this is Jim Venable and you're listening to StoryWorthy in the key of C. That is some dorky shit. Welcome to the Story Worthy Podcast. Here are your hosts, Christine Blackburn and Hannes Finney. Welcome to Story Worthy. My name is Christine Blackburn and I'm here with Hannes Finney, and we're coming to you from the Warner Brothers Studios. Because, well, because. Our, our guest tonight, composer James L. Venable is a composer who has done a lot of work in animation. And I always associate Warner Brothers with bringing animation to the forefront of the American animation industry. So he may have never even worked there, and you just pulled that out. You just said, okay, I like Warner Brothers, so we're there. I guarantee you he likes Warner Brothers cartoons. Oh, no, I'm just, I'm just asking. I thought maybe you were going to pull in something that he's done, and then, you know what I mean? No, no, I no no interest in that whatsoever. Well, listen, this is very exciting because Jim Venable is on the show tonight. By the way, I get to call him Jim. Did you know that? Wow, really? Uh, He's a composer. I'm going to call him Jam. This is our first composer on Storyworthy, Hannes. Our first composer. Really? No, I I find that fascinating. No, 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 a composer. As opposed to musician, we've had, uh, what's his face, Griffin Griffith. Uh, John Thomas Griffith is the man who wrote the theme song, Follow Me. See, now you're saying he's not a composer. He might be insulted by this. Wait, say that again? Well, you're saying he's not a composer, but he composed that song. Oh, no, 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 no. This is, no, no, no. Jim Venable's on a different kind of level. No, no, John Thomas Griffith is a fabulous rock star. He's yeah. a rock star, and sure. he's incredibly good at what he does. No, uh-huh. no, no, no. This is a composer. This is a different kind of person. Now, you've been to a sound stage on, on a studio lot. Yes, okay. yes, I have. I used to work over at Paramount giving tours. Before anybody would think I was actually, like, working in Paramount, I was giving tours for Paramount. Yes. But I would take, you know, the guests on to or the tourists onto the soundstage. And so what it is is basically a huge room that almost looks like a high school gymnasium without the bleachers. Yeah. Beautiful hardwood floors. And there in that room is a setup for an orchestra. Yeah, exactly. And then on one wall is a screen, a movie screen. Yeah, and they're recording to, you know, the the, the way, you know, for you people and not the civilians out there. Uh, yeah, they make the movie before the the music is scored, usually. So the, the music, the, the film is done, the film is edited, and then uh, they're adding the music after that. So it's so like you have to watch, the conductor, conductor is looking at it, watching it, right. and doing the music, which has been written to accompany that scene. And so he's directing the or- orchestra while watching the film. Yeah. And James Venable, Jim Venable, writes that music. See, I'll be interested in finding out the difference between, see, the way it used to be in the golden age of Hollywood, as I as I like to call it, you know, there was a lot of music and a lot of cues like uh, there'd be a scene and you'd hear like the horns go or something just indicating like that this is the funny part. Right. This is, get it, get it this way. Or, mm, oh, this is very serious. And it was... And I like it, but a lot of people don't. They're not used to it. Now, you, music tends to be used a lot less uh, or a lot more it surreptitiously. Depends on the film. Because depends on the film. But, the, it, the John but it used Williams to be all stuff. films had, yeah, yeah. John Williams is old, very old-fashioned. Everything John Williams does, he's dictating exactly how you're supposed to feel. It's almost like spoon Yeah, he almost makes Star Wars seem like a good movie. Oh, I went there. What? I, you can go there with me because I'm not a fan of that of that stuff. Yeah, I when just... When I saw John Williams at the Hollywood Bowl, okay, don't send 
angry emails. I'm just saying, it's just my opinion, okay? <laughs> yeah. Folks, I didn't care for it and, you know, spent most of the time in the in the picnic area at the top of the bowl where you smoke a lot of weed. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. That's where I was because I'm just, the John Williams stuff, I'm just not that. To pull you out of the weed area at the Hollywood Bowl, it's got to be quite, I think perhaps only <laughs> Neil Young, well, who, that's very true. whose window you missed to date true. him. And I've been listening to Jim Venable's music and, you know, he did Jay and Silent Bob uh, Strike Back, yeah. Strikes Back. There, the soundtrack to that to that film, and there's a lot of heavy guitars and a lot of really beautiful music, very Neil Youngish to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I love it. And so there was an example of not so much using a full orchestra, but right. More well, of a that's Beatles, a, almost a Beatles sound or something. Right. It's yeah, being a composer, but using you know more modern rock. Instruments. I mean, he also worked on the Powderpuff Girls, which I loved, and Samurai Jack. I love yeah. that show. I mean, these awesome. are these are huge movies, and Star Wars: The Clone Wars. Now that I'm seeing it. Oh, oh great! I did insult the oh, something you worked on. Star great, Wars. it's fun. one of the. I it's swear a great to God, show. I could not get enough. Star Perfect. Wars. It's not at all just a hackneyed retake of in the of, dark of, Star Wars. <laughs> yes, yes. You actually have a uh, Darth Vader sexual device. That is how Han shot first. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, Christine listen, okay. shot second. Here's Thank you. Thing. I'm here all week. Jim Venable Tip your waitress. brings forth the topic: the bridal march. Yes, that's that's his topic. Okay, so then I start thinking about well, there's the bridal march, then there's the wedding march. They're two different songs, but but they're both played. I don't know. Equally or what? But we have a sample. Of, I don't know. Let's see. Well, this the is first one? this is a Wagner's Wagner's bridal. And when he says chorus. Wagner, I see Wagner. I'm just saying. Right. That's because you're an American. We all know this song. Okay, so this is right. Da, Here comes da, the bride. Da, da, da. You're all dressed in white, even though she's not a virgin, and we all know it. Now this is an it's interesting song, song, the bridal march, because I was looking in, you know, reading about it. And it's funny because they say it's actually a song you wouldn't want for your wedding because it's about marital infidelity, <laughs> tragedy, and paganism. Wagner also wrote, was uh, was Hitler's favorite composer. Yeah, I mean, and this so, is what he wrote about. Right, exactly. Now, he wrote before, you know, I believe it was the early 20th century. But, yeah, he wrote like, you know, uh, people just uh, – well, there's, there's songs like that all the time where people just aren't – even songs with lyrics where they you don't listen to the words – but you're just you're like oh this is a happy go lucky song you realize it. it's like remember born in the USA obviously Bruce Springsteen big hit Ronald Reagan was being all patriotic he's like he was playing born in the USA at his rallies until Springsteen told him to stop now born in the USA's lyrics are entirely about a guy who went to Vietnam his life was ruined his brother was killed he came back he works in a steel mill which gets closed <laughs> down and he's ironically like oh I'm so happy to be born in the USA and Ronald Reagan's like oh this is fantastic it's like people don't listen they yeah, you they take listen. what they want out of it all right so the, that's that bridal march and then the the other one the other one, the wedding march, I guess you would say, is the Mendelssohn one. The Mendelssohn one. Let's hear a little Written bit of that. Written in 1842. Now this sounds like this. This sounds like a funeral march to me. Oh no, this is absolutely beautiful. This is so beautiful. Most often played with that church pipe organ, which is, I think, what we're hearing. Yeah, what we're hearing now. Yes. <sighs> Someday. All right. So the I'm thing is, though, those are the, the 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 two wedding marches people may think of, but a wedding march actually really can refer to any piece of music that a bride walks down the aisle to. You know, it's right, the tempo. Exactly. It's the, you know, it's the... And thank God, by the way, we got away from... Remember they were doing those uh, sort of uh, uh, flash mob things at weddings for like a year where all of a sudden, you know, everybody, they would start playing uh, Beat It or something and everybody in the wedding would jump up and start dancing in the aisle and you're like, I just fucking stop it. I think that, I think that, that would be very sweet and very... Why would why would you get sad, you know like ugly on that, Hannes? How could you find that at all disheartening? Like you don't find that. Have you ever cool. met me? <laughs> I can find. First of I all, I can find. You could bring inspiring. a baby in here, and I'll be like, "What's your problem?" <laughs> oh, I so, get to shit myself. So so far in life, I've walked down the aisle twice. There, I said it. Yes. Well, that's the one of the problems time, with this stuff. Is like <laughs> it's the most beautiful music in the world, and my friends did a flash mob, and five years later, they're divorced. <laughs> So <laughs> there you go. So don't take it so freaking seriously. Well, and just have a good time that enough, day. I suppose. And when I first it's got married, good, and yeah. I was only twenty five, I I walked down the aisle in a park, you know, in a garden. I at the last minute, my mother made me wear shoes, but you know, it was the whole like flowers in my hair. <laughs> yeah. And I walked down the aisle to 
Dan Fogelberg's Since You've Asked. That's the name of the song. See, we should have that queued up. Since You've Asked. But it's actually very beautiful because it's, you know, like, what I'll give you since you've asked kind of a thing. It's, yeah, you know, but it's that, all my see, time to together. Me, it's very that lovely. That sounds like you married, it's like, oh, you said, all right, I'm fine, I'll marry you since you asked. Well, it's like, I'll give you half it, my sandwich you know since, since he asked. You know what? I think that that's absolutely accurate. And the fact that he got another girl pregnant a year and a half later, you know. Yeah, but uh, then, you know, you say, how, you say to her, how did you get pregnant with a married man? She goes, well, he asked. Yeah, that's the thing right so, there. Oh, yeah. boy. Anyway, okay, second time I got married. <laughs> yes, uh, I, this is I walked, the one I attended. I walked down the aisle. Yeah, you were at that wedding in Ohio. And I walked down mm-hmm. the aisle just to um, my friend's, uh, my friend who's a composer and a yes. pi- pianist. And I just walked down uh, the aisle to a piece of his music. But here's the thing. In both weddings, mm-hmm. at the end of the wedding when they say, I now pronounce you a husband and wife or man and woman or whatever they say you are. And I, I now pronounce you trapped in hell. No, I now <laughs> pronounce you in the center of the volcano. No, I yes, now pronounce for you for a whatever. limited period of time. The first time I got married, I had the Beatles. You know, love, love, love. You know, all you, know, yeah. all you need is love. That God, was the there was so time. much weed smoked at this wedding. The I'm second, sure. The second, the second wedding, I was, and you were in charge of the music at the yes. second wedding. And yes, yes, and I, I missed my cue. He missed his goddamn cue. Right. It was like, okay, he's gonna pronounce you man and wife. Hit the button. I think I hit the button and it didn't work, or I hit the wrong button. You hit the button, it didn't work, you panicked, you hit the button again. Yes. And then again, and then finally it came on, and it was quite lovely. Do you remember the song, Hannes? Uh, no. Okay, think Beatles, right? We're on the Beatles path. Um, yesterday all my trouble seems so far away, but now I'm married. <laughs> no, and it was now Octopus's I'm the rest- Garden. Octopus's Garden, yeah. It was Maybe I'm Amazed. <laughs> Oh, right. Maybe I'm amazed at you. And really, if you listen to those lyrics. Yeah, maybe that should have been a precursor to. Yeah. I'm amazed we're getting married. <laughs> yeah, the rest of us are too. <laughs> but we since are. you've asked. <laughs> yeah, you asked. I mean, you can't say. This is good. Hey, Christine, can I uh, can I drive your car off a cliff? Well, he asked. Okay, this is the key. Just ask Christine, yeah, and she yeah, will yeah, always. Yeah. I'm, I'm a giver. That's the problem. Uh, all right, you guys, we have a storyteller coming up, Jim Venable, and he's got a story titled The Bridal March. So something, it's going to be something, something about, about... There's some music, they'll be marching. Maybe it would be funny if there was no music in this at all. It's literally about a bride like being marched in World War II by the Japanese <laughs> yeah, that's, to uh, that's Guantanamo, funny. Yeah, that's Guantanamo Bay. Right that would there. make enough. All right, you guys, but before we get to our storyteller, I did want to mention that if you'd like to support the story worthy the podcast, that would be terrific. That would be terrific. Here's what you can do. Head on over to storyworthypodcast.com. Yes. And there you will find, well, there's our Amazon banner. Right. You can click on Amazon and you can buy copies of Powerpuff Girls or, uh, you know, Samurai (laughs) Jack. And you can, and you shoot, whatever you're going to buy, we get a little taste and it does cost you a thing. Or you can also head on over and join our Patreon campaign where you become a patron of the show. You help us out. You give us like two bucks a month, four bucks a month. Yeah. For $10 a month, I'm going to text with you. Yes. How about that? And for ten dollars and fifty cents, <laughs> I will sext with you. So, oh, it's actually, just ridiculous. But anyway, yeah. there are things you can yeah, do. Yeah, just there. you know, what are you going to do with two dollars a month? There come on, go. give us two dollars a month. Come on, come on. Well, so, We're supposed to come up with elaborate arguments, but really, you, you like listening to shows for two dollars a month? Come on. All right, you guys. Also follow come me on, on Twitter, at Storyworthy. So, folks, wherever you are, stay tuned because composer Jim Venable is on his way here. on Storyworthy, we have comedian and host Suzanne Wong, and I'll be talking about my left tit. That's next time on Storyworthy. Hi, this is John Thomas Griffith, and you're listening to Storyworthy Podcast with Christine Blackburn and Hannes Finney. Who is that guy? have uh, gone deep inside the studio, and now we are in Townsville, USA. Townsville, USA, of course, except everyone except Christine knows, is the home of the Powerpuff Girls. Why can I not know that? I don't understand. You would never have watched cartoons, and they'd, uh, like, you might have seen cartoons watched, that your daughter watches, but this is no, I mean, before I watched, her time. Yeah, but I watched, growing up, I watched Bugs Bunny and all this that, is, you This know. is... From uh, the early like two uh, thousands yeah, no. uh, through, and it's like I was see, an I, adult, Hannes. That's what? what I'm saying is you didn't you don't watch cartoons as, as an adult. I watched the You're, Simpsons. 
That's not the same thing. I watched South Park. That's animation. So that's you're saying animation. that's all different. Well, no, it's like, actually, the Powerpuff Girls was very well written and very clever, but it's disguised. Uh, it's almost one of those things like SpongeBob SquarePants, where it seems to me like it's disguised as, as a kid's show. Mm-hmm. Like, there's a kid's show there. Like, they can watch it and go, oh, I like this. But if you're an adult and you're watching SpongeBob and you're high as a kite, see, finally, something you can relate to. The, uh, the I, I kid. It doesn't I matter. Can't, you, can't. Your, your words are bullets off a tank. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> hey, you know what I recently heard? I recently heard that on the lot of Warner Brothers, the squirrels are so tame that they're just like pets over there because of years of, you know, it's like inner squirrel. The population Inter- of the squirrels at Warner Brothers have like bred. Interbred with each other. incredibly kind they're squirrels. They're like the Roosevelt's. They they have they marry their cousins That's all strange. the time. I know. Uh, although I, I think it's just that um, squirrels in show business, they want to be vicious, but then they <laughs> see agents and they go, I can't, I can't <laughs> compete with that. All right, you guys. He's here right now, Jim Venable. He is a composer, and among his award-winning credits are the scores for Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back, which I mentioned earlier, Euro Trip, Scary Movie 3 and 4, and several animated series, including Powerpuff Girls, like you said, Hannes, and Star Wars, The Clone Wars. You can find them over at VenableMusic.com. And I have to tell you, you go to VenableMusic.com, and mm-hmm. there's samples of his music, right? Yes. You sample the scary music, okay? Yeah, you'll just, just click you'll, on it. You'll pee a little bit. Turn the lights off, and you're, you'll shit your pants. Yeah, no, I'm not exactly. kidding you. His music is so intense. I dare you to take stuff. your take your iPod or your uh, <laughs> tablet of some kind and go and you listen to the scary music while you look in the mirror. And you look in the mirror and you say, James Venable, James Venable, <laughs> James Venable, three times, and he will appear on your toilet. He it's unbelievable, ladies and gentlemen. Scariest thing you've ever seen. You can also find him on Twitter at JLV Music. All right, you guys, wherever you are, put your hands together for Jim Venable. Thank you, thank you. Wow, I've been enjoying listening to you guys talk. You guys, I, I, you actually described my nightly ritual as far as the looking in the mirror. That's pretty much how I get things going. Actually, it's more of a morning ritual. Um, well, it's really great to be here in Townsville. I, as mentioned before, I'm a film and television composer. And uh, these days, I guess that also includes all media. So I, I, I write music that accompanies some sort of visual or something like that. And, and sometimes I write music that doesn't accompany anything. It, it accompanies my feelings about life at that time, like I would put that out. Um, so my story today is actually from uh, my early days as a budding young composer. I started off as a DJ working for a company called You Should Be Dancing, still here in Southern California. Great place. D- did they do your wedding? <laughs> uh, judging from the results, I guess we didn't do it too good of a job. And I don't think my story is going to support the company either. It will support the company. It won't support the quality of people that they hire, though. Um, so I, you know, I was in college at the time. I was very aware of all kinds of music, and I was really fortunate to work as a DJ on weekends. And I worked as the music librarian for the whole company during the week. My job was to supply each DJ with the latest tunes, which really was cool. I got to go to the record store. Kids, that, that's a place <laughs> where you used to go and buy records. And they were physical things that you would buy, and they had pictures, and it was a whole experience. You could listen to an album. That's a lot of songs in one place, and you could kind of hear what the artist had to say at that time. So I'd go to Tower Records, and I'd buy all the latest hits, and I'd stay up on everything. Part of our job also um, as DJs was to communicate with our clients, be they uh, bar mitzvah kids or bat mitzvah kids. And in this case, it was a wedding coming up. So I did my, you know, couple weeks before, 10 days before, I gave the bride a call and said, you know, my name's Jim Venable. I'm going to be playing the music for your event. I'm really excited about it. We're always really excited, whether we were or not. And I would... Uh, Love to hear, you know, what, what kind of music are you into? What kind of music do you love? What kind of music don't you love? All that good stuff. And so we kind of went through all the different kinds of music that she was into. I jotted, made some good notes. And then, you know, I noticed on my uh, sheet of paper that I was also going to be handling the ceremony, which uh, Hannes yes. will, will attest to. This is a nerve-wracking gig. The <laughs> ceremony probably takes up maybe 10% of the whole evening but it is an intense 10% because if you don't get it right, you've pretty much blown the whole thing for the rest of their life. 
<laughs> so it can be intense. And I, uh, looking back on this story now, I, I probably should have taken that a little more seriously. But I was thinking about some girl who kept putting her hand on my leg and was sort of acting like she wanted to be more than friends, but I couldn't figure out why she just wanted to be friends. And I was talking to the guy I was working with. And anyway, sorry, I jumped ahead. <laughs> back to speaking to this bride. I said, um, you know, any other important pieces of music? And she said, yes, there's one piece. It's for the ceremony. I have always dreamed of walking down the aisle to the music from the movie Somewhere in Time. And being a young film composer, I'm like John Barry. I know it well. Uh, the music from Somewhere in Time, that's Christopher Reeve's movie. He, uh, you know, it's kind of a time traveling love story. And I'm thinking, great, I know the song. I've sent it out to many a DJ. I'm very aware of the song. As a matter of fact, while I was on the phone, I reached over and I grabbed the John Barry anthology and put it in my bag right then. I'm like, okay, that's taken care of. I'm, I'm set. So now we cut to the, the wedding day. I'm getting all set up and talking to my buddy about the girl who kept putting her hand on my leg. And um, kind of, you know, just it's a normal day. We're, we're at the place. We're on time. It's not overly rushed. I get all my speakers done. I get my CD player up. I put in the music. I see track nine, Somewhere in Time, John Barry, track nine, pop it in. I look down. I notice one kind of peculiar thing, that the song was nine minutes long. And I thought, that's an awful long song. I'm sure it'll be fine. <laughs> so I'm standing in my post waiting for the wedding planner to, you know, say, okay, hit it, you know, and I'm just waiting. I got my finger hovering over the play. And uh, I see the bride line up. She's to my left, and she's going to walk down. I'm basically facing down the aisle uh, from the rear of where they were doing the ceremony. I'm facing the priest, in essence. So she's going to walk from the left, pass right in front of me, and then walk down the aisle. I'm going to watch her walk down the aisle. So I'm all set. I'm really excited. They give me the nod. I hit play, and the song starts off. It's a, it's a little low-key, kind of... And it, it's kind of dark, and I'm thinking, well, it's a film score. You know, these, these things, they, they go through different emotions. Yeah. I'm pretty sure it's going to pick up. should be cool. And she starts walking, so I'm thinking, all right, we're good. She's walking. She's not giving me a look like, what the hell are you playing or anything. So it keeps going. And it's getting a little darker and getting a little twisted, like adding some weird string effects. <laughs> And it's starting to get really strange. And I'm thinking, crap, man, I, I hope this gets better soon. Because I, I, I should, this is probably the part of the story where I should say, I am very familiar with who John Barry is. And I'm very familiar of Somewhere in Time. And I'm very familiar with all this stuff. But the key thing here is that I am familiar with this music. I've handed it out a lot. Come to think of it, I've never actually played it at a ceremony. So... I'm very aware that this is the right piece, but for some reason, it's not getting to the point, if you will. <laughs> so she comes. She's right in front of me. I'm looking at her just to give me any kind of look like, hey, you know, something's wrong here. And I can maybe recover, turn down the music, fast forward something, figure it out. She doesn't look. She turns right to the left, right in front of me, starts going down the aisle. And now it's starting to get really weird. Like the brass is coming in. Ring, 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 I'm going to keep going so you can really feel how long this went on for as she's walking down and people are, I can feel the room kind of going, why did she choose this piece? This is weird, but I'm sticking to my story. I've got it turned up full blast. It just keeps going. And she gets to the priest, and she's just standing there, and I'm still just praying it'll break into, bah, na, na, na. you know, I'm waiting for it to get to this part, and it never gets there. And I'm still waiting, and it's, bum, bum, dun, dun, bum, you know. Priest kind of finally looks at me, and he just kind of shakes his head like, <laughs> it's not going to happen. So I fade out, and everybody kind of looks at each other like, what, what the fuck was that? So I'm standing there, and now I'm, got the music down and my heart's racing and I'm realizing I have completely blown this wedding. I fast forward into this tune. I realize the nine minute tune was actually a suite for Somewhere in Time. And I believe the movie starts off with a big nightmare scene involving death. <laughs> so I definitely got that covered for her wedding. 
<laughs> but this was not going <laughs> to you know, meet, meet the need of what she described as her lifetime dream of walking down to somewhere in time with her dad. And I wish I could give like a really great ending to the story, but actually the, the best ending I can give is that it was the day I learned like some things you can't fix. <laughs> like this. <laughs> Um, I didn't. I, I was very lucky. I had a very, I'd been with the company a long time. I had a very understanding boss. And, you know, we also did the reception and we gave her a great reception. I mean, it was really like a hit it out of the park reception. But when did she, when did you catch her eye? When did you both say like, when did she say, what was that? Um, my, the MC that I was working with, he, you know, spoke to her after the ceremony and she was very upset. She, I don't, I don't even know if she ever got her head out of that place during the whole ceremony. I think she was just sort of fuming about the moment yeah. being lost. And, um, I actually never, I didn't speak to her until the next day. My boss called me and he's like, what happened? You know? And I, I said, I blew it. You know, wow. I, I did. And I should have queued it up. And he was like, yeah, you, you're, you know, check the song. You're you know, with yeah. You Should Be Dancing, uh, yeah. not You Should Be Crying, <laughs> yeah, exactly, Jim. Come exactly. on now. I know, I know, I know. And so, it, but seriously, both times I got married, we did like what they call a run through. You know what I mean? Where the, you would see how the music is going to flow and this is how it's going to sound. And yeah, you know, they, they, probably, they look, they said he's a professional. We don't need to do no. it. I, and, and I will say, I mean, I worked for the company for 15 years covering. I never blew a ceremony before or after this. But this was one I, I I didn't realize how much was of... Was this the first track on the album? It was, it was track, no, nine. track nine. So it was track nine, but I just queued it up to the beginning of the track, which is, you know, if you're going to DJ, make sure you listen to what you're playing. Don't just trust the, the label. Sure. You know, this is something I learned. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, they were able to recover from it a little bit. I think the videographer put in some music, put in the right music when she walked down. So hopefully she... So it's just happy, like, you know, she is, everybody's looking at her face like, you fucking asshole. And they're like, it sounds so happy. I don't yeah, understand why, is why everybody mad. I wonder it's if this woman is still married. I, I'm dying to know this. No, no, no. no. She Facebook may have given birth I, to the devil. If, <laughs> believe me, I, I, if I, we didn't have Facebook or we barely had computers back then. No, we had computers. But I I did. I don't remember her name. I could probably find it if I had to. So I, I, it's I, weird <laughs> because like, no, it's like I had no idea that was the story. And then Christine remind me how I messed up the queue at her wedding. So it's it's funny that it's like basically this on a professional level the same story, but I wonder how often that happens. Everybody must have gone to a wedding where they played the wrong thing. I, you know, I don't think it happens that often. I don't. Thanks. No, I, I'm just saying. Appreciate it. I'm, I'm glad to be on the show. This, Hope to come back. Only if you're paying for someone. <laughs> Do you remember really the opening the scene of The Omen? And I'm picturing, like, let's say there had been a wedding. It was like a garden party. It was party, that creepy, and too. And then somebody yeah. screamed over, Damien! And he was up on the thing, right, and then right. he jumped off. Yep. That's yeah. what I thought was going to happen. That's kind of how I felt. <laughs> I wished well, I had jumped uh, off while myself. I was, I was trying to get ahead of you, and I'm like, so I started to look up somewhere in time. And as I type it in, there's an album by Metallica also called Somewhere right, in Time. And right. I'm like, oh, I see where this is going. He picked up the wrong album. But no, you just played the wrong track. No, I'm a jackass. Off of the... Uh, yeah, it, it's funny. They didn't... They used to put out like a whole album of just the music. Right. For movies, this was before you could just go buy the movie on what we used to call video cassette kids. And it's like, so I think people were like, I really like that movie. I can't just watch it anytime I want, so at least I'll have the record. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. A lot of those growing up. Yeah, like, that was yeah more but they musicals, don't, they don't really we had, like, do that much anymore. They, they do them yes, sometimes. Do. Yeah, I'm not talking about musicals. I'm talking about just the film score. The score, not, yeah. Oh, I not see. Because they didn't used to, you know, they started to do a thing where they would put a hit or they would put, a, a, you know, a, a song mm -hmm. by a heart artist in the soundtrack so that they could sell the soundtrack. But before that, it was just like, no, it's John Barry's score for somewhere in time. There's no singing. There's no artist. There's no Prince song somehow stuck into it. That's just all it is. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Zhivago and and uh, I'm the only, by the way, okay, let me tell you just how crazy I am. I like the movie The Shining. The show's not that long, honest. Yeah, we don't have to. Okay, let me give you a little tiny example. I bought the soundtrack for The Shining. Mm -hmm. Now, The Shining is just, is actually all uh, classical music by, I think, Bella Bartok. Of like, you remember The Shining? It's like, of course. <laughs> I walked down the aisle to that. Yeah, exactly. I like fucking Are you the lady? To this. I was like, what is wrong with me? I also bought the soundtrack for uh, Apocalypse Now, which had like a, like clips of like narration yeah. from 
you know, Martin Sheen's like, play outside well, we want to out- of, of your house at Halloween. I mean, that's- right. I would sit and listen to it. You can see how fucked up I was. But let's get back to how fucked up you were. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm here. You're here. May as well. But now you're a successful <laughs> composer. Well, yeah. Now you have learned to control music and make it your bitch. That's well put. I, 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 I think that quite, should be now. your quite slogan. Put it that way. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, Jim. No, I do want to go back. Um, when did when did you in terms you started playing piano as a child? I did. My my grandmother uh, made me take piano lessons as a kid, and I reluctantly did that. And then around high school, wait, I wait, sw- I want to back up oh. right there because I have a seven year old <laughs> that I am working with with piano and. It's only 10 minutes a night, and you would think that I've got, like, a hot iron on her back. I mean, yeah. it is so hard to get her. So, I mean, I know what I do now is I kind of get steer her to songs that she likes, like Katy Perry songs or Keisha songs even, just, like, hearing the notes, and then we, we transcribe it in little in notebooks, so she's writing the notes. And- I think that's a great idea. I think if... if- someone's getting into anything, be it music or sports or whatever, it's start off with it from a fun standpoint. Yes. Keep it fun because if if you start getting into all the hard stuff right off the bat, you're going to quit. You know, know. It's, not, it's not fun. But if you develop that love for whatever it is in the early so stages. So how old you know, were you and what did your, did your grandmother, did she have the piano or was it at your we, house? We had a, I, I was raised by, by my grandmother oh. and uh, so it was at where I lived and... Um, yeah, she made me practice a half an hour a day. I probably could have handled wow. 10 minutes a day, but a half hour was a little long. That's a long time. It was. And I stuck with it as long as I could. I had a period of time where I wished I'd stayed with it, but I switched over to drums in high school, and I'm kind of glad I did. I, it gives me a, a more of a rhythmic approach to the music that I write, mm-hmm. and I'm really you know happy and feel blessed that I did that. But um, but when you went over to drums, because you're talking about, of course, it was an upright piano. Yep. And now when you're talking about drums, you're talking a full set. Full set of drums. And I had the most amazing grandmother. She bought me my... First, she let me play drums on her hat boxes for years. <laughs> and I I would basically do air drums with her hat boxes and kind of live being one of the Beatles or Rush at the time was a big oh, drumming yeah, band. Oh, yeah. Getty Lee, man. Yeah, yeah that's Forget right. Forget about it. Neil Pert on drums, though. Getty Neil Lee, Pert, good singer. Right. Neil good singer. Drum- you know. That's right. And uh, the, uh, you know, that was something I loved doing. But and finally, my grandmother was like, "You're really serious about this?" I was like, "Yeah." And so she bought me my first set of drums, and um, I kept at it, playing in rock bands and that kind of a thing. And did you be- play in the school band? I didn't. We we ha- I guess I did, but we had a kind of a small band. I went to a pretty small school called Providence High School in Burbank. In Burbank, California. Oh, so you wow. Okay, you're right. F- you're from Born and Los raised. Angeles. Yeah. Interesting. Yep. Oh, you're okay. the one. Yeah, yeah, I exactly. Had to Not too many of us. That's yeah. right. And uh, yeah, I kept up with that. Played in rock bands. Had a great time. And this was all in the '80s when synthesizers and things were happening. So I started getting into electronic drums, and then that slowly led me to, wow, these these samplers and things that I'm buying can do more than just drums. So I that's what kind of led me to music was writing instrumental music for me to drum to. Now, were you on like that Roland D50 that was a really popular That was keyboard? a super pop. This is a little before that. This is like more circa Prophet 5 and Pro 1 and Moog was just starting to come into wow. play. The D50 was kind of a second, third generation when things were really starting to get lush. And when you were in those rock bands, were you guys writing songs or this was just your, your covering? What were you covering? We did some covers and we did write some songs. I wasn't really a writing force because at that time, particularly, I wasn't a lyricist. Mm-hmm. So I w- it was more like maybe the guitar player or the singer come in with an idea, then we'd all kind of jump in. I'll, I'll come up with my drum part and you come up with your keyboard part. I love it. Yeah, we just kind of put it all together and it was a lot of fun, actually. Yeah. We were called, my the biggest band I was in was called Live, which stood for Living in Visual Ecstasy. Now that's an 80s name. I think the name. key is ecstasy. Well, there I think there that's is a the band key, called though. Live. I mean, from I know, the 90s. I know, and we took so much credit for them for a <laughs> while. But no, we our our heyday was more in the 80s, and our claim to fame was we we played at the Troubadour on Sunset. It's a very big deal. Yeah, it was super cool, and we came in second to a band called Guns and Roses Get for numbers nice. that week that or whatever true? it was. Yeah. Wow, man. Yeah, so this that's was neat. super cool. Yeah, that is really cool. I mean, that's that's saying something. And you also have a band called Chinese Democracy. They still that too. Yeah. <laughs> still that as well. Then yeah, but I, I want to say who is your now as far as film composing. Who is like your top three favorite film composers? Well, I, <clears throat> well, I'm afraid to say it now, but John Williams is definitely top of my, no, no, no. my top I, three. No, uh, I, I was, you know, I get this question a lot. It kind of depends upon what I'm working on mm-hmm. yeah. as to what I'm listening to. I, you know, off the top of my head, Thomas Newman, John Williams, and James Newton Howard 
are See, the I people knew off the top one of, my of head. the Newmans was going to be in there. Now, is people that don't know, that's Randy Williams' uncle or his father. Uh, Alfred was interesting. A, let's see. Uh, Thomas Newman, I think he's like a nephew of Randy Newman, oh, if I'm not mistaken. In, because I, Randy Newman is the, is the both his uncle and his uh, yeah, father Lionel were Newman. big film yeah, composers big in time. the 40s mm. in Hollywood. Yeah, yeah. He okay, wait, were, okay, go ahead. Man. No, no, go. I'm I was going to say we got to we got to backpedal because oh, listen, John Williams. I recognize the talent. It's not that. It's just not my type of. Because because I don't like those types of movies. I mean, I didn't really care for E. T. No, okay, again, no oh email. Oh my please. God! Here come no, the police! I like the character movies. I'm a Woody Allen. Fan, you know what I mean? I'd rather watch Blue Jasmine. Yes. I, I'm just saying. Like there's just a Luke, different... I'm your father. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm just, just saying. I had a you little know, thing. So also, John I'm marrying his sister, but that's a whole other. It's very specific. Terrible and Woody he's Allen. Created person. an empire at doing what he does. So of course, like you know. Yeah, that's but Blue Jasmine is the last of a certain like that old fashioned. Like I was saying, it's like. Wall to wall music. Well, what was amazing, mm. you know, Jay and Silent Bob for me was sort of my kind of time to embrace that way of working. Right, because right. It, it was right. We're, we're sort of at the tail end of a transition now, but I, Jay and Silent Bob for me was I got to work with a live orchestra. They had me. Kevin Smith had a lightsaber scene in that movie. <laughs> so, I mean, there was no more pressure than having the director of the movie starring in the movie saying, what are you going to do for my lightsaber scene? And the crazy thing was, it's like I bled over that and did my best John Williams to give him the best wow. bed of Star Wars that I could. And it's yeah. tough stuff. It's yeah. Yeah. I, surprisingly tough is what to play under the dialogue. Like, how do you keep that kind of churning drama going without interfering with what they're saying and the crazy thing was is that right after kevin was on then his sidekick jay came out and i did this big techno thing which is sort of the the kind of music i learned through doing a lot right. of djing and kevin flipped he was like i love that techno thing man that's amazing and i'm like yeah but what about the other thing like that huge yeah. orchestra thing and he's like well that's like a prerequisite like wow. if you're a composer you should know how to do that and i'm like okay now i'm understanding what's going on here yeah do you almost see the music as like a third character in absolutely the yeah I, I really try to you know music we don't want to tip anything off we're usually commenting after the fact at least a little after the fact um we never want to give anything away ahead of time mm -hmm. but yeah i do look at music as probably one of the only ways that you can give nonverbal communication from the actors short of them sign languaging or, mm -hmm. you know, acting, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. acting, a, a lot of acting, people, <laughs> whatever, <laughs> enough of that bullshit. But it's funny how people don't necessarily hear that until they hear it without. Like when I would take these tours on that, in, at the, on the Paramount lot, we would watch the, we would go over to the Foley stage and, you know, watch a film, which there is no sound that is original when they're shooting a film. It's not the actors, not the sounds of the footsteps and yeah. not the music. There's nothing there. So they're, they're literally importing everything after the fact. Yeah. And people were just amazed when you hear it without the music and then what you hear with the music. It's yeah. just a different thing. It's a, it, you know, I think, uh, who was it? Uh, Mancini said music is kind of the glue. Like, yeah. you know, and that's how he, he would give advice. He would say, you know, when people say, well, what do I do here, man? And he's like, just give it a little glue. Just <laughs> yeah. give it a little glue. You just, yeah, I like Sorry, that. you just made me think I remember saying, have you ever been to the Geffen Playhouse? It's, uh, it, it have, used to be the yes. Westwood Playhouse. Yep. And uh, they've got all these sponsors for various things. So apparently Henry Mancini gave the money to uh, improve the men's room. <laughs> So it's now the Moon River Men's Room. Oh, that's nice. funny. And nice. uh, they all, and you walk in, and it's all posters of his movies and his songs playing while you're peeing Beautiful. during intermission. That's with hilarious. A, and it's like, I, I, I'm like, at first I was like, well, this seems a little disrespectful. I'm like, wait, he must have done this on purpose. This is pretty damn funny. Yeah, it really It's like, is. I'm going to think about Henry Mancini. Every, I'm going to pee. Every time I pee, I'll be thinking, Moon River, um, wider <laughs> than a something. That reminds me of that Andy Williams joke you told when Yakov Smirnoff was on the show, and you what said Andy, Andy, River, Andy Williams is the only singer who can sing a song lying down. I yeah, yeah, yeah this joke, that. he would actually just lie on a couch and <laughs> sing for a whole... A he could sing. Yeah, it was the same thing. He was always famous. Anyone was famous for, he would take a nap right up until he was going on stage. And yeah, I think out. he lived at the theater in Branson, if yeah. I'm not mistaken. Wow, yeah, I think he amazing. lived upstairs yeah, was, and he would roll out of the bed. Yeah, and he would roll out of bed going to say, hey, That's amazing. That's great work if you can get it. Well, there, <laughs> there used to be, you know, a lot of uh, comics that were broke would sleep on the roof of the comedy store. You know, that happened a lot. Right, right. Okay, wait. So, a couple of things. Kevin Smith, how did he find you? Kevin Smith 
fortunately for me, watched Powerpuff Girls with his daughter. Mm -hmm. And his first, our our first meeting was for a show called Clerks the Cartoon. Mm -hmm. And that was over at Disney. And I was brought in by a lady, great lady named Bambi Moe. Yes, Mm -hmm. her name was Bambi. Mm -hmm. And uh, she said, I'm going to introduce you to Kevin Scott. Scott Mosier was his producer at the time. And they just want to meet you and, and you guys can talk a little bit and we'll see what happens. And to her surprise, literally within the first minute, they're like, so we want you to do for our show what you did for Powerpuff. You know, wow. do you want to do that? And I was yeah. like, yeah, Yes, I totally. would thank you very much. Yeah. Well, it, it, it's such a weird thing in, in Hollywood that sometimes they're like, no pressure, but you're just going to have to make entertaining small talk with these people alone in a, in a fluorescently lit office. And then your entire future may rest on this. No pressure. Right. It's like, what the fuck? No, and this <laughs> was crazy because it was it was like a speakerphone call. I'm standing in front of her wow. desk, and they're in New York. And then, Oh, know, they weren't even there. Oh yeah, God, so it's like, okay, meet Kevin and Scott. And I'm like, hey, guys. And they're like, hey. And uh, that's what they sound like. Um, <laughs> and I don't and even then you're think, like... <gasps> well, they weren't stoners at the time. I don't even know if Scott is a stoner now, but Kevin, who is now a major stoner, right. at least... To date, I don't know. I don't know what he's doing now. Now, now, I don't know what he's doing right the second. <laughs> he's uh, in the other room. Gotcha. Yeah, <laughs> it's all part of our. This uh, the show is not called Story Worthy. It's actually called Gotcha, yeah. where you insult a person to give you a major break in show business, and then we bring them in to confront exactly. you. Today it's we are very Venable, ladies and gentlemen. Exactly. Oh my goodness. No, so, it, it, but yeah, at the time, I don't even think that Kevin was pretty much straight. Didn't do any kind of weed. Didn't drink. Didn't do anything. Yeah. Here's the thing, he though. Just Holly- ate. Uh, and I, I say that as a person who eats. Here's I, the thing, yeah, Hannes. In Hollywood, as you know, the preparedness meets the opportunity. So, you know, you're prepared, you're prepared, Jim Venable, he's prepared. And all of a sudden, here comes the opportunity. And you didn't see it coming, but why shouldn't it come? Because you're prepared. No, and the crazy thing is what, yeah. like, Kevin said to me when, when I first got on that job, he goes, So, where do you normally record? And I'm at the time, my closest thing to normally recording was I visited (laughs) Paramount to watch James Newton Howard record. You were on my tour. (laughs) Yeah, I probably was. And so I, you know, off the top of my head, I'm like, Paramount? And, you know, he's like, well, who's your contractor? And the only contractor I knew was Sandy DeCrescent at the time. I'm like, Sandy DeCrescent? And what else do you need? I'm like, a choir? Like, you got a choir? No problem. I mean, it was crazy because they had just done Dogma. So they had all the budget they wanted. And, you know, it was amazing. I, I challenge story. anybody to have a better first that's film story. That's a great story. story. Now, the mo- uh, the music for Scary Movie 3 and 4, that's a lot of fun. That is a really great opportunity because I get to combine horror with comedy. Abs- yeah. And, and it seems like that would be similar. tough. No, you but know, they are similar. They are. No, no, no. I know, but it's like to, because, yeah, to do the music, it's like it has to be scary, but it can't actually be scary because, you know, well, tell... You probably know better than me. How do you combine well, those two things? You're bringing things up an interesting up. point. Yeah, you know, David Zucker was the uh, director on Scary Movie 3 and 4. And um, his approach, like the approach that we kind of came up with is that the music is the straight man. Music is never going to try to be funny in these okay, movies. It's more about yeah. setting the, the tone. You know, if we were spoofing signs, then I got this opportunity to look into signs and kind of say, my, my usual best approach was to go, what... If it was say James Newton Howard, what would James Newton Howard do if he had to write more music for mm-hmm. Signs? Mm-hmm. So how can I kind of expand on what he did using new material, but keeping the same essence, yeah. if you will? Yeah. But, no. But I also, think- isn't there a lot of anticipation between comedy and horror? Because there's these moments of building and building and building, and then pow. lots of setup and punchline. So yeah. you're right. And so very you're, similar. Yeah. yeah, it I, is. I think it's very similar, and that's. I mean, I'm thinking I'm going to the movies. I like a comedy gives me the same adrenaline as a horror movie. I agree I'm both with you. Reacting to both, as it were. I I'm with you. Okay, 100%. I want to play some shotgun story worthy, but first I have to ask you. Um, I don't know if you're married now, but I know you were married in the past. What song did your bride walk down the aisle to? Oh, very good question. I interesting. It kind of ties in, not sort of. Well, anyway, uh, I wrote my own uh, music for for the day I got married, okay. and so I composed this piece of music. I actually had uh, Sophia, the mother of my children, now. I, big dead pause. I'm trying to think if there's anything else <laughs> nice I can say. Lots nice I can say, actually. Yeah. Well, yes, so anyway, so she's in house. the other room with Kevin Smith <laughs> doing yeah, a they're doobie all gonna right come in now. And hit me over the head with a frying pan. Yeah. Um, no, so I actually recorded Sophia walking down the aisle as part of the rehearsal. I was a little more prepared for my own yeah, wedding than I was for it. hers. They <laughs> were like, I'm not letting some <laughs> asshole <laughs> screw this up. kid mess up my wedding. Track it was so nine. funny. I and So I scored her walking down the aisle and then... I literally videotaped it and scored it. And the funny thing was is that the day of the ceremony, she walked 
probably 10 times faster than what she did at the <laughs> rehearsal. Oh, sure, because you're and nervous and stuff. having learned from my own mistakes, I literally yelled out, stop, slow down, <laughs> got to slow down. <laughs> and yeah. she, she, she was like, okay. You know, and, and I kind of wish I'd done that on the other story. I wish I just said, wait a minute. Just can, call can we the just, attention what's going well, on. Like, yeah, look. I know. Can we just hold on? Yeah. Let me find the right music. We all music. know what's going on. <laughs> can we just stop? Yeah. Isn't Instead that of ruining this woman's life. Yeah. Oh, man. So that was the everybody in the audience. Did they kind of chuckle? Oh yeah, yeah. Everybody we laughed. chuckled. We all had a good oh, laugh, good. and good. Uh, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> I bet. I bet. Hey, listen. You want to play some shotgun? I would everybody? love to get off the wheel. Music can only mean one thing. It's time for Shotgun Storyworthy. The game where our storyteller spins the storyworthy wheel of truth and tells a true one-minute story about the topic it lands on. So everybody, say it with me. Spin that wheel! Virginity. Perfect. Great for the guy who went to 13 years of Catholic school. Um, Virginity. Let's see, I was raised Catholic, so I pretty much was taught that I should remain a virgin for the rest of my life. And um, if I did anything sexual, it was dirty and wrong. So this really uh, made a conflict for myself as I got older into high school and these sorts of things. And um, what am I supposed to do? Tell my first time or just roll, go do my own thing? I want filthy details. (laughs) (laughs) Her name? No, I'm kidding. Um, No, so... Probably about midway through high school, I, I, I sort of, you know, grappled with these these conflicting messages of the inside and, and my sort of human body messages of like no more virginity, Jim, and uh, and the Catholic message of wait till you're married, Jim. Ultimately, the body won, and um, I I had an odd thing the 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 person that I lost my virginity with, we actually had this long discussion with her older brother about how to make sure she didn't get pregnant. And he gave us like play by play, like you need to get this kind of rubber and you have to get this kind of contraceptive gel and spray. You know, I, hindsight, this sounds pretty strange. Yeah. And I'm kind of wondering about the brother and the sister relationship now that I look <laughs> back on it. But And there were some other weird signs that I'm not going to get into. But that that's pretty much my, my virginity story is that it took me a long time to crack that code. And then I, I think I got it right. I think somewhere in the past couple of years, it's starting to become more clear, clear to me. <laughs> Yay. Mm-hmm. Well, that's you do have two children, story. so you were able to. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I figured up. something out. Yeah, no, that's, yeah, a, that's exactly. a really good story. And you guys obviously had enough maturity to talk to anybody. Yeah. I mean, that's pretty cool. The brother cool. thing, though, that is a little weird. Yeah, was this it was Kentucky? consensual. Yeah. I mean, they were talking. It was a conversation. Yes, yes. Yeah, and it, you know what? I, I kind of amped it up to make it a little weirder just to make yeah. the story better. But actually, it really was kind of cool to have somebody other than, say, an adult figure, yeah, exactly. you know, that was actually like, I get it. I know what you're going through. What it, My main thing was I didn't want to get her pregnant. That's right. what we were always. And I have two daughters now, and that's like the only thing I care about. Just don't get pregnant. You know. Well, but the thing is, I was brought up Catholic, too, and I've ha- I had that shame thing. I mean, believe me, I know exactly where you're coming from, and it was just, you didn't talk about your bathing suit parts. Right, Because right. You, you learned that at school, or maybe your brother or sister told you, but nobody, like, Colt told me anything. Right, I mean, bra ads, they used to put the bra outside of a turtleneck at that yeah. time, you know? <laughs> Like, that was a bra ad I when I grew up. a fetish I still have. <laughs> Interesting. Where I like, by the way, this has nothing, I just have to say, I was looking you up here on, on Google. You come up, uh, you're the, you, James Venable, the music guy, are the first three. That's good. The fourth, James, the fourth entry is James Venable, 92-year-old leaner of the Ku Klux Klan. I, so I, you, sh- you share your name with an elderly racist. I so love congratulations. It. I love it. And the thing is, I'm not racist, but the thing is, I am so white <laughs> that if I name any other race, I come off racist. Like That's if true. I if I say a Mexican guy, I sound like a racist. If I say <laughs> right. a black guy, I'm racist. Right. You can't yeah, you you have to do that thing where you can't describe people. It's like you have to everything but the most obvious person. No, no, no. You want to talk to the guy at the theater, he's he's about six two that's he's ridiculous. Got one leg. He has to, what, he's got one leg. He's got a mustache. Room, is, if you look at me across the room. The black guy, room, I don't see color. Right. <laughs> if you look at me across the room, you would say, look at that That what? Blonde girl. Blonde girl. Okay, so is that a bad thing? That, that That's... Well, that's what that's that's the really not white. a race. That's the no, thing. We but got. the thing is, yeah, like, but if I described you and I said, uh, she's about five, four, and she's blonde... 
you're assuming you're white in the first I place. See, I if see. you're a black girl and I got to say she's blonde, but she's black, then all of a sudden it's not like I'm criticizing her for dyeing her hair blonde. Right. Because again, much like our guest, I'm white as the driven snow. You guys are both clear is what you are. And yes, the thing, we are. The thing I don't tan, I stroke. Whenever I hear people of color speaking of themselves, they always have like all kinds of cooling, like caramel colored and coffee colored and different. <laughs> all, and I always wanted to jump in on that, but I feel like that's that, yeah, that area. Can't. I can't. I'm not you allowed. Really, yeah, you're not. I can describe all the white people as pink. Yeah. You know. <laughs> when I was pink a f- or white or, or <laughs> perhaps no, modeled. Just as long we're talking about the colors, when I used to be a flight attendant, I worked with this pilot who would, you'd go up to the cockpit at the start of your trip and he would say, hey, Christine, I just want you to know my coffee I want it to be this color so that the next three or four days that I'm traveling with him, he had a strip, like a paint strip of the color <laughs> chips, and he'd say, this is the color I need my coffee. I'm like, you're an asshole. And then, of course, I had to do that. Well, you could have peed in it. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been a lot of fun. Hey, before we wrap it up real quick, Jim, what does it mean that you're a music coach? What does that mean? Oh, um, basically, if there are other young budding composers, which actually I hear it's a pretty rising profession right now, I'm available for a fee. <laughs> to uh, speak with you about, you know, career path. I can listen to music and respond to it. Most of what I do is based on intent. If the client has a certain intent, I want to become a great film composer along the lines of X, Y, or Z. Then yeah. I help them understand if they're putting out their intent. Wow, I love that. Yeah, so yeah. basically, you're you are on track or you are not on track. Exactly. You know, if you're telling me this music's supposed to make me sad or make me emotional yeah. and it's making me laugh, yeah, then. I can give you one opinion based on my experience. Sometimes as an artist, it's so darn hard to hear your own stuff. Mm-hmm. And it's so and at nobody, it's not like they're taking it personally. They just need to be somebody, you know, cut this away from me and show me what the meat is. Yeah, you need to kind of step outside of it. I very often will have to, you know, sleep on sleep on a piece or get away from it in some way, shape, or form just to kind of see it from a fresh perspective. Get back fresh, yeah. I yeah. can imagine. I can imagine. All right. Well, listen, thank you so much for coming thank today. Thank you for having really me. It was a pleasure being here at and I'd Townsville. Like to, uh, I'd like to thank everybody here at Sideshow <laughs> Network, including Sean Merrick mm-hmm. and our beautiful sound girl. And her name is Maria Spertolozzi. And yes. I've got that name right now. And I'm so excited about that. And not to say that she's some kind of crazy hippie, but she's behind the desk right now. She took the office chair out and is sitting on one of those inflatable balls she's that's a, supposed she's to be good for your hippie. back. No, that's what she is. Crazy hippie. Her, and her hair and the ball are the same color pink. Yeah. It's madness. And also, she's been editing the shows a lot for me, which, let me just oh, say that. Oh, that's sweet. She's therefore my favorite new sound girl. Yes, exactly. And I'd like to thank John Thomas Griffith. You know, he's the guy that wrote the theme song, Follow Me. I have no idea who that is. I'd also like to thank our storyteller tonight, Jim Venable. Thanks again. Thanks for having me. It was great to be here. Say hi to the clan. And on behalf of you, Hannes Finney, my dear friend and co-host, my name is Christine Blackburn saying, make it a story worthy of you. you can Thanks for joining us on the Story Worthy Podcast. We'll be back next week with all new stories. Subscribe to Story Worthy on iTunes and visit the Story Worthy website at storyworthypodcast.com. Follow me. Follow me.